Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome National Security Correspondent at Politico, Brian Bender, and our distinguished panel. Thank you, everybody, for coming and, and for <laughs> sticking it out. I know it's getting late in the afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, thanks to Concordia for such a great event. And thank you to this very distinguished panel. We are going to dive right in. And I'm going to start by laying out a scenario. There's a terrorist attack inside the United States. We don't know much about it. We know it's high profile, it's mass casualty, and the Islamic State in Syria has claimed responsibility. Maybe we could start with you, General Petraeus. You are the CIA director or the director of national intelligence. The president is going to count on you to help him figure out what's going on. What do you want to know in those immediate minutes and hours after this attack? Well, I think most immediately you're trying to think about are there other uh, possible attacks connected to this. So you're immediately not only trying to figure out what took place, how did it take place, what was the cell structure, who supported it, how did they uh, take the various actions that they did, but you're also very concerned about the prospects of additional attacks. I mean, Fran lived through the 9-11 attacks, and I, I was in uniform at that time, actually deployed uh, in the Balkans. I remember our concern was that there's, a, there's more coming. So the immediate, that's the immediate question. Obviously, other people, first responders and others are taking care of the scene, restoring order, uh, taking care of the casualties and all the rest of that. What the intelligence community has to do, together with the law enforcement community, because they have the responsibility domestically, uh, is again, try to determine uh, the source of this, how it happened, and most important of all, uh, is there something else out of this particular uh, cell or team uh, that could result in an attack elsewhere. Then ultimately, of course, there are others who are determining, okay, precisely uh, what's the home address of this group, uh, where's their headquarters, uh, what, and then you'll start to work on the, the options, if you will, contributing the uh, intelligence analysis uh, and so forth as, again, National Security Advisor Townsend in this particular scenario uh, starts to direct the integrated effort uh, that will result in courses of action options for the President of the United States. Mr. Secretary, let's say you have your old job back. I'm not sure you want it, but you have it back. Uh, your responsibility is to defend the homeland. What do you want to know about this? But also, walk us through a little bit how likely a scenario like this is. I mean, obviously, there have been attacks here on, the, on, on U.S. soil since 9-11, not anything of the scale of September 11th. Um, but how likely it is that, that ISIS could choreograph in some way a large attack on the U.S.? And if so, what do you want to do in the aftermath? Well, I, I think you've pointed out, and it's accurate, there has not been a large-scale successful attack on the U.S. since 9-11. <clears throat> in 2006, I know, uh, you know both of the co-panelists will remember, we had a plot that was hatched in the United Kingdom to attack airliners going from Heathrow to North America. and. Um, we were able to shut that down, but the immediate issue you face is who else is part of the network and what is the follow-on attack? And that's uh, really largely driven by investigation and intelligence. So you want to get their communications. You want to, uh, if, they've, if they've got a, a residence, you want to go through their residence for any indication either online or on paper that might indicate future plans. Uh, you really want to do a link chart and analysis of who else might be out there. Um, at the same time, there are certain things you do automatically. You're going to raise the uh, level of security at the airport and critical infrastructure. You're going to uh, raise the level at the, uh, at the uh, border in terms of people coming in. As you get more insight, um, you can refine a little bit what measures you add, but you always start with the broad and you kind of narrow it down. And then the last element, and again, this falls within the, the domain of intelligence, is you really want to review all the metadata indicating whether individuals were in contact with somebody else once you've identified who committed the act so you can see if 
if you can follow the chain elsewhere. And that's the critical value of what, the metadata program, the collection of metadata. You know, could we have this again? We've done a lot to make it very difficult to infiltrate a number of well-trained operatives to the US. What we've typically seen are situations where people get inspired or they get online recruitment. Um, we could get a returning foreign fighter or two, but I think the idea of having what we got on 9-11, which was 19 people coming in as operatives, is, is quite remote. Um, and I think, frankly, the model now for terrorists tends to be uh, either recruiting groups in place or inspiring them. Well, let's, let's unspool this hypothetical scenario a little bit more. A piece of intelligence that is learned in the aftermath is that this attack was planned by a veteran of the civil war in Syria who fought for ISIS, uh, is a European citizen, so holds an EU passport, and came into the United States through normal methods, <coughs> normal immigration methods, to hatch this operation. Um, Fran, talk about your views on, on how well prepared we are to anticipate those so-called foreign fighters that have gone into the battlefield, have presumably gotten battlefield experience, training, indoctrination, and as we've seen in some of the attacks in Europe, then go back to where they came from and try and inspire others. How good are we at that? Where else do we need to go? So in the wake of 9-11, we really did learn the lessons of trying to pull together law enforcement and intelligence information to get a fuller picture. And what we found after the large-scale Paris attack was that our European allies, their information sharing, they had not learned that lesson. They hadn't lived through it, quite frankly. So I'm, I'm not, that's not pejorative. It's just the reality, right? Once you've lived through a, a really large-scale attack, you're forced to learn the lessons. And so US officials, the intelligence community and law enforcement, have worked quite closely with our European counterparts during the Obama administration and now the Trump administration to ensure that sort of more seamless flow of information, especially as it relates to foreign fighters. Look, our European allies have got a much bigger problem than we do. There are far more Europeans in that battle space than there are Americans. But in your example, right, if it's a European coming in, the question, the first question of the National Security Advisor to particularly the intelligence community is, what did we know and when did we know it? Um, do we have information or do our allies have information? Can they be helpful to us? It depends on which European country it is in terms of the capability of that intelligence service. But frequently, as we know from sort of just recent events, oftentimes when these sorts of attacks take place in Europe, this is an individual that's somehow come on the radar of intelligence and law enforcement. And so it's likely either the United States or our European allies will have had some information that will help focus the investigation. Um, I think what the, other thing, the other point I would make is you have to be careful in any large-scale attack. Um, the natural impulse is to action, right? The president is pushing the interagency to do things. And what you don't want to do is overreact in a way that has sort of worse consequences. And so you know, the first thing that would happen, I promise you, in Washington is talk about should we do away with the visa waiver program? We've lived through this. Um, the economic consequences of that would be devastating. And so what you want to do is understand this particular case and then target your response uh, in that way. You mentioned the intelligence sharing piece. Obviously, that has come a long way since 9-11, both internationally in terms of with our allies, but also within the United States between the federal, state, and local governments. Mr. Secretary, maybe you can address that. Is that as better as we were told it is? Or uh, uh, as some suggest, there are still major gaps, particularly on the, the federal, state, and local uh, connection? I think, I think there are two dimensions. It's clearly better, but I would say there are two issues. One is you tend to find when there's a lack of sharing domestically, it's because the collector does not appreciate the fact they've got something to share. And if you go back to the underwear bomber uh, back in, in 2009, the, uh, he was coming out of Nigeria. His father apparently went to the State Department and said, my son is becoming a terrorist. And they just didn't get it together to input it into the system. So some of that is training and also the difficulty of keeping a sense of urgency <clears throat> so people don't get 
habituated to become complacent because they see it all the time. Europeans have a different problem. As Fran will remember, they got very conscious about privacy and were very resistant to sharing information with us. We had a big uh, dispute for a while about even basic passenger information being shared with us. Uh, and what we've learned is that that information can be critical in drawing the dots and showing your picture of something happening. And what the Europeans are facing now, and I think you, know, you pointed it out, um, a lot of times someone is on the radar screen, but they don't have the wherewithal to follow it up. And I think where they maybe need to kind of rethink their approach to this is using technology to track people once they have hit some kind of, a, of an awareness. So you don't just drop it because you don't have enough people to follow them around. Let me just raise something here, because by the way, the, the way this person probably entered the United States was not through the, quote, immigration process. It's probably just as a tourist. Uh, the truth is, if, if you really <laughs> want to be a terrorist in America, you're not going to do it through uh, the immigration, uh, which is a very long, drawn out process, particularly if you have any kind of link whatsoever. I would bet in many respects, though, as, as both of my colleagues said, that these individuals are identified. I mean, there's a vast uh, pool of data, uh, and it is shared with our European partners. Uh, again, it can always be done better, but the sharing between the uh, intelligence agencies, first of all, in the community itself, of course, with the advent of the DNI, uh, and then the sharing between the intelligence community and the law enforcement communities, are, it's vastly improved. I mean, this is, again, another function of DNI is to push it back and forth the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, among others, uh, do this. But, and then you have these counterterrorism joint task forces throughout the United States and all the major metropolitan areas led by the special agents in charge in those respective areas. Uh, and everybody is part of that. I used to visit them as the director of the CIA. People would think, well, gee, you're supposed to do outside intelligence. Well, this is, again, to ensure that there is the sharing and the liaison uh, and the connecting of the dots across all of these different organizations, because that's the key. So let's take this hypothetical scenario and trace it back to, in this case, Syria. Um, as you all know, Syria, over the last six years or so, has become really the new Iraq, in some sense. Uh, when you were there, when you were commander, the, the foreign fighter element much, that, much worse. that has flocked to Syria sure. to fight Assad, to yep. fight us, to fight the Russians, yep. to fight uh, the list goes on and on. Um, let's say in this scenario, we learn about some of the activities of the ringleader, if you will, of this terrorist attack from the Russians, because the Russians have intelligence and they decide it's in their interest to share it with us. Um, maybe we can start with you, General, since you've spent a lot of time in that part of the world. How worse is the foreign fighter phenomenon there? The, the outsiders, not just from Europe, but the Middle East, who are flocking to Syria for this latest round of the war, if you will. How bad is it, and how much worse might it get? Well, actually, I think that it is beginning to improve. I think you can actually remember I somewhat famously told a reporter, forgetting that you know I was not off the record in the fight to Baghdad, tell me how this ends, because it was pretty clear to me even by then that this is not necessarily going to go down the way that it had been briefed. Um, and, Look, Syria is much, much worse than Iraq. I mean, half of the population of the country has been displaced, about half of it internally, half of that internally, half of it externally. Uh, 500,000 or so Syrians have been killed. So as horrific as Iraq was when we launched the surge in 2006 with, say, 52 dead bodies every 24 hours, civilians from violence in the capital of the country, Baghdad, uh, this is qualitatively and quantitatively vastly worse. There's also, I think, two very important distinctions between Al-Qaeda and its affiliates over the years and the Islamic State. The first is that the Islamic State truly established a caliphate on the ground. That is a big deal. And the second is that they've been very, very diabolically, barbarically clever in using the, the new battlefield domain, which is cyberspace. They've used internet service platforms, social media, uh, all the different opportunities that are out there in the, the regular web and also the dark web. And the skill uh, and sophistication of what they've done is very, very impressive. And I contend that that is the area, in fact, where they're, they're 
needs to be an enormous, considerable effort uh, by those that control these social media platforms and the uh, internet service providers. Uh, Prime Minister May has said enough is enough uh, about allowing extremist content on there. Now, it's much easier said than done to get it off with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on, but we've got to do better and better at that. Let me ask our other panelists that question. The, the online recruitment, the, the sophistication, if you will, that, that what groups we think of as fairly unsophisticated have figured out. Uh, are we losing that battle, the battle for hearts and minds, whatever you want to call it, on the internet, and also the battle just to get ahead of their, their planning and, and all the things that they're doing in the open, on Twitter, et cetera, but also on the dark web? Well, you know, I think there are a couple of, <clears throat> of challenges to this, and, and bear in mind that uh, what people think of as the web is really the visible part is really only a small fraction of what you have underneath. I think there are things we can do better to track um, recruitment and incitement and to shut down recruitment and incitement. You get more subtle things where there might be you know, something out there that's not quite at the level of incitement, but they're monitoring who goes onto the site and then they're reaching out to those people using a tool that's encrypted or something like that in order to try to create a relationship. Not terribly different in some respects than what pedophiles do to groom children. And so I mean, I think some of those same techniques can be deployed here. But in the end, the, you know, and this is a bigger issue for Europe than it is for us, we have to also look at the people who are being attracted to this. Some of them are disaffected people who are marginalized in society. We also, to be honest, have a lot of people who are kind of mentally ill who get attracted to this, and if it wasn't going to be this, it was going to be something else. And so we need to begin to work with the community to come up with a way to say to family members and friends, if you know somebody who looks like they're beginning to take a, a dark road, you let us know and we need to intervene. And to be honest, that may not be a criminal justice intervention because it's hard to say to a parent, turn your child in so they can be put in jail. We need to start to think creatively about ways you can divert people into non-criminal uh, supervision to kind of wean them away from this. So let me pick up on something Secretary Chertoff said. Um, he, you made the analogy to pedophiles online. So that was a, an algorithm developed by a scientist so you could identify the images, right, and get child pornography off the web. We went, I, I was so frustrated that across now, we're into our third administration trying to tackle this problem and the government's been unsuccessful, that along with Senator Lieberman, I created a nonprofit called the Counter Extremism Project. We went to that scientist who created the algorithm. He adapted it to be able to identify video and audio and pictures related to terrorism. What inspired us to do this were the beheading videos, um, the burning of the Jordanian pilot in a cage. And so we then went to the social media companies. I will tell you to say that I was outraged and disgusted by how slow they were. Now to give them credit, they've come around. There's been enormous congressional well, I, I pressure. I was gonna ask you about that. I mean, now that you're, you've left government and you're on the private sector side, uh, what more should the private sector be doing whether it's social media companies or others, to assist the government without, of course, crossing their own red lines, and not, not to mention the civil liberties red lines. But what more can business leaders be doing, or what should they be doing that, that, that they're not doing? So I think now they've come to a point where they understand they have a responsibility. It's a difficult line for them, in fairness, right? Because what you don't want is the private sector to become censors. But not all speech is protected by the First Amendment. And there are some pretty clear, Mike and I are both lawyers, um, and there are some pretty clear, bright lines. And I think now the social media companies don't really want to be associated, right? Google doesn't want uh, on you to pull up a, in order their advertisers, pull up a website that is an extremist website and name your company doesn't want their ads on the side, right? And so there's a commercial reason as well as sort of a good public policy reason pushing these companies to get much better. And, and this technology does exist. Again, this is a tougher problem than child pornography, which a machine can recognize more <coughs> easily. And again, it, where is your right of free speech end and incitement to violence begin, which is really the test at the end of the day. Uh, but 
there, there has been progress. I spent a day recently with what used to be known as Google Ideas with Jared Cohen and his team. They've made quite considerable progress in how to do this, and now what they've got to do is deploy it uh, in more substantial form, and the same with the social media platforms. Let's get back to our scenario. In the wake of this attack, uh, and this alludes to what you mentioned earlier, Fran, there's public clamoring for us to do more militarily in Syria, to go after the bad guys, if you will. Uh, you know, in our hypothetical scenario, the president is also calling for that. Leading members of Congress want to do more militarily. And that brings me to a broader question that I want to put to all of you. Back in the wake of 9-11, there was this common talking point, if you will, it was almost gospel, that we need to fight them over there so we don't have to fight them here. And that was used, you know, quite frankly, not just to justify the invasion into Afghanistan, the top of the Taliban, but two years later, the invasion of Iraq. Um, General, maybe we can start with you since you have the military background. What more could be done militarily? And at what point does doing more militarily actually increase uh, the number of jihadis increases the radicals who want to get revenge? Well, I mean, to get to that particular question, uh, we had a question always on the walls of the operations centers of units that I was privileged to command, starting with the 101st Airborne Division in Iraq and the invasion, and then the first year, and then subsequently in each of those. And that question asked, will this operation take more bad guys off the streets than it creates by its conduct? And so that is the question that you have to answer. Uh, obviously, if you kill many in innocent civilians uh, or uh, damage a lot of infrastructure needlessly, uh, you're going to have a backlash. And so that's the test. By the way, that applies at the policy level too. And I would contend that firing the military in Iraq without telling them what their future was and firing the Ba'ath Party without an agreed reconciliation process uh, created tens of thousands more enemies uh, than we had before we uh, implemented that policy. So that's the first piece. The second is that for all of these, I think the measure of merit right now has to be how can we achieve a sustainable, sustained commitment. Look, this battle is going to go on. This is a generational struggle. Everywhere that there are ungoverned spaces, Islamic extremists are going to exploit them. We have to do something about them. Las Vegas rules don't apply in these areas. What happens there, unfortunately, doesn't stay there. It spews violence, instability, extremism, and a tsunami of refugees into neighboring countries. We've got to lead, but it should be a coalition, include Muslim partners, comprehensive approach, not just all military. Again, every problem's not a nail that can be dealt with with a bigger hammer. Uh, but then it has to be sustainable for a, a generation. And that means sustainability in terms of blood and treasure so that you can indeed have a sustained, comprehensive campaign. Mr. Secretary, we have about <laughs> two and a half minutes. Um, where does it go from here? Uh, you mentioned the refugees, the displaced people in Syria. Those refugee camps are rich territory for radicals, for terrorist groups um, to recruit. How do you see Syria playing out? Not just the civil war itself and how, it, how does it come to an end, but, but the consequences of the last six years in terms of the, the, the terrorist threat. So I, I will say we've been late <clears throat> to address this issue. Um, and I, I think it's important that we did uproot or in the process of uprooting ISIS from where it actually controls territory. That can be very dangerous. It gives them economic power. It allows them to experiment with weapons. But the real issue is you've got to have stability. And uh, frankly, the refugee problem, which I think was exploited by some of the tactics that was used by Assad and the Russians supported, generated a huge amount of stress in Europe. This is not sustainable over a long period of time. And in fact, one of the things I argued recently is if we back away from even taking a minimal amount of refugees, we're putting our allies in a very difficult position. We've got to try to stabilize the situation on the ground and get people into a safe area, maybe a safe zone, where they can go back and begin to rebuild their lives. If you don't do that, you have two bad consequences. You create a Petri dish in the camps for people who begin to be recruited. And you know, by the way, someone I know who studies this says now the Rohingya in Bangladesh been chased out by the Burmese, now they're beginning to get pinged by the extremists saying you have to join ISIS because you've been mistreated. So um, unpacking those camps is very important and they've got to go back to a stable location. 
We haven't had a chance. Happen, by the way, I, I would contend that you are seeing the beginnings of that in some of these areas that have been secured, where ISIS has been cleansed, and uh, where, frankly, we're providing some oversight and overwatch. One last question. The, the, the last, my last word on this is: you can't do that until you de tackle with or Assad. You have to deal with Turkey, who's playing out their own interests on the border, and you've got to deal with the Russians, right? We are not going to fashion a strategy, an effective strategy, by ourselves without dealing with the multilateral problems where these the interests are playing out. You answered my question, which was about Russia and Turkey. So <laughs> I think we're just about out of time. Again, I want to thank our distinguished panel. Thank you guys so much for doing this, and thank you to everybody in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.